Hello, I'm Susan Adler, Executive Director of Boston Jewish Film. Thank you for joining us for the final Q&A of the 33rd Annual Boston Jewish Film Festival. We'll get started in just a few minutes. I see that lots of people are joining, so we're going to give them just a few seconds to log on. I've really been looking forward to this Q&A. I know it's going to be terrific, so we will get started in just a few more seconds. All right. Now, here is a word from the Boston Jewish Film President of the Board, Taryn Metzen. Hi, everyone. I'm Taryn Metzen, President of the Board of Boston Jewish Film. Well, Festival 33 is almost a wrap. And as you all must surely know, it takes a village to put on a great festival. I'd like to thank Ariana Cohen Halberstam for her outstanding curation of this festival. I'd also like to thank all the interns and our theater managers who work behind the scenes and to Marie Bryant, who does our live captioning all the way from Houston and does such a beautiful job. I'd like also to thank Anne Bersani, our office manager who keeps us in line and to Joyce Betancourt, who does all our social media outreach and outreach to you, our audience through the e-blast and our graphic design and to Joey Katz, and many of you have seen Joey Katz moderating our panels, and he does such a fabulous job. And of course, to our director of production, the backbone of Boston Jewish film, Niselle Clark. We couldn't do a festival without her. And to our amazing technical wizards, Loran Lento Black and Wesley Hicks, who create all the magic of this virtual festival, and to Susan Adler, our leader, our executive director, paying attention to all things great and small, does such an outstanding job. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you very soon at our Israeli Film Festival in March. Thank you, audience, for all your support. Good night. Thank you, Taryn. The Boston Jewish Film team has worked so hard to plan and present this festival, and we have been so pleased with the feedback our audience has provided. I echo Taryn's appreciations and offer congratulations to the magnificent Boston Jewish Film team for all they have done to deliver a wonderful festival. Boston Jewish Film is incredibly fortunate to have a very dedicated and active board of directors who each contribute their insight, guidance, and support to the successful BJF festivals and programs. Many board members provided introductions to the films this year. The board has been led by President Taryn Metzen. Taryn is passionate about BJF and is a true visionary whose tenacity, enthusiasm, commitment to excellence and strong leadership has helped BJF thrive during her tenure of which two years have been during the pandemic. It has been a pleasure to work alongside Taryn. I've learned from her and appreciate everything she has done on behalf of Boston Jewish Film. We are exceedingly grateful to everyone who has purchased festival passes, tickets, and to our generous foundation supporters, corporate partners, film sponsors, including the Israeli, Canadian, and German consulates, Brandeis HBI, and the Goethe Institute, who is sponsoring Persian Lessons and our upcoming Q&A. Thank you again for attending the festival and supporting Boston Jewish Film. And here's Joey Katz to introduce our panelists for the Persian Lessons Q&A. All right, thank you so much, Susan. Um, thank you so much, Taryn, for that lovely video and uh, for those lovely words. Um, hi, everyone. I am Joey Katz, the program associate with Boston Jewish Film. And thank you for joining us today on our final live Q&A event, part of the 33rd annual Boston Jewish Film Festival. Um, this is one that we've been looking very much forward to, um, a film that I think a lot of people have questions and comments about. Um, so we're, I'm gonna read our, read our guest bios today. I'm gonna hand it over to them um, and let them talk about uh, everything that, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, 
Um, I'm going to start off uh, with our guest today, Vadim Perlman, the director of this incredible film. Um, Vadim Perlman is a Ukrainian Canadian American film director. Following a successful career as a commercial director, Perlman made his feature film directorial debut in 2003 with House of Sand and Fog. The film, nominated for three Academy Awards, also marked his first screenplay credit. Since then, Perlman has directed four feature films, numerous episodes for television and music videos, all which have received critical acclaim. Um, we're very excited and honored to have you here, Vadim. Thank you. Um, and tonight's or today's uh, conversation will be moderated by Professor Avner Shavit. Uh, Avner Shavit teaches at Wesleyan University, holds a PhD from the New Sorbonne University in Paris, and is a former or is a member of its research team. Sorry, Shavit has presented his works in the universities of Cambridge and Yale, amongst others. He's also one of the most prominent film critics in Israel and has been covering the local and international scene for the last two decades, in which he has covered major film festivals and published interviews with leading filmmakers. Um, so yeah, thank you, Avner, and thank you, uh, Vadim, for joining us today. And I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you so much for the invitation, Joey. Thank you so much, Vadim, for the film. I'm honored to uh, speak to you again. So the first time we met was after the world premiere of the film and the Berlin Film Festival was just one moment before COVID so much has changed uh, since. And I want to ask you, the film has traveled a lot in the last um, two years. Uh, it's been to major film festivals. Uh, what were some of the most interesting, the most surprising, most emotional feedback you, you got on the film? Well, um, Berlin was certainly a highlight. Um, it was uh, the first time I'd really seen a film with the audience. And uh, for me, that's a huge uh, watershed moment, usually, is to see what their reaction is and then to feel their emotions. And, and it just it's a whole different way of viewing a film than, than it is in a controlled environment of the edit room or anything like that. And so, uh, I mean, this, they, they, it was very honored. Uh, I was very honored by a standing ovation. Um, 10 minutes it lasted um, until they kicked us all out of the theater. And uh, it, um, but really the most, so, you know, there's, there's always a sense of, um, a sense of a bit of skepticism from my part in moments like that, because I know they know the directors in the audience and the actors are in the audience and the, the great German actor Lars Eidinger is in the audience. And uh, so they clap, you know, to me, it's maybe they like it, maybe they don't. Next day, I think it was no, in two days in Potsdam, which is former Eastern Europe, Eastern Germany, <clears throat> uh, there was a screening really for people for students, for uh, blue collar workers. I mean, it was, it was a very kind of a populist proletarian uh, atmosphere. It was pouring rain, cold night, and you know, Monday, I think it was. And it was the same thing. They didn't know I was going to be there. Uh, it was a surprise that I did a Q&A, live Q&A at the end of the screening. And they, they sat there and they clapped at the dark screen, you know, so that would, it, it really was one of those moments. And just now, the summer uh, Romanian film festival uh, in Romania, Cluj, you know, I was, uh, I think my, my plane was late, so they took me straight to the screening, and I had no idea. You know, I mean, I wasn't prepared for this. They had the whole town, it's an old ancient town in Transylvania, closed off uh, completely, uh, the whole old center. And in the main square, among all the giant statues and fountains and, and the cathedrals, they played my film on, on, on the giant screen, you know, and they had, I think it was 5,000 people there <clears throat> in folding chairs in the middle of the main square it was quite incredible for me and then i went up in front of them as well and talked about it so you mentioned lars and and of course the film features two great actors lars and, and noel um i remember you saying that casting is 90 percent of, of the process uh so can you talk about the casting or how how and why did you choose lars 
And well, Lars, Lars was uh, an easier choice. Uh, you know, I was uh, usually the way it works. My casting director puts a list of people in front of me that they feel that I should um, pay my attention to. And I do. And uh, Lars was, I mean, he is, I don't know if you're familiar with this, with this actor and his body of work. He is, you know, he plays Hamlet and Richard III in, in the biggest, most prestigious theater in Berlin. I mean, he is, you know, he's, I think he's like a national treasure over there. He, he's, <laughs> believe it or not, he's still an extremely underrated actor. He's incredible, incredible talent. Uh, so he was an easy choice, I remember. Uh, Noel was a little harder, A, because um, he didn't, well, he's Argentinian. Uh, his native language is Spanish, obviously, and uh, he lives in Paris, so he knows a bit of French um, quite well, I might say. But he didn't know a word of German. Noel didn't. And he had to speak the whole film in German. And, uh, and uh, it was quite funny because uh, I had to go on faith. He said, don't worry, but you might, you know, I'll, I'll get it. And I said, well, how, what is it going to sound like? I mean, like, you know, what do you mean? You'll get it. And he said, well, what, why don't we do a little run through? And so, so anyway, every day before, before filming, every night before the day of filming, because they lived in the same hotel, in Belarus, um, Lars taught him how to speak the day's lines phonetically. <laughs> and then on the screen, Noel taught Lars how to speak the fake Farsi lines, <laughs> you know? So it was, it was quite um, ironic kind of, a, uh, but he's, you know, he's, a, he's an incredible actor too. I was quite, quite pleased. You mentioned languages, and of course I will ask one specific question about the language in the film. First, I, I want to, if I may, ask a more general question on language. Besides being a film about the memory of the Holocaust, I think it's also a film about language. So can, can you talk about why are you interested in this philo philosophical subject of the language? Well, I think language is what defines us in a, in a strange way. I think that me being an immigrant coming from Ukraine at 14 years old to America, you know, to Canada specifically, I, I had to, I had, I had a chance, just like, just like Gilles, the, the character, to reinvent myself completely and to, to kind of fake it till you make it type of thing. In English, you know, I, I, I completely immersed myself in English, you know, and uh, I, think, I think language also, in a way, if, in the film, it allows Koch, this fake language allows Koch to say things that he wouldn't in German, to open up, to show his bit of his human side, the way that, you know, the way that he would have never dared in German. So it is, it is quite important as, as the theme of the film, but also I think in, in the world we live in, I think it's quite important language. Yeah, and, and, and now the, the, the specific uh, questions. So if you can talk about the, how, how do you invent the language for the film? I, I remember, I know you worked with a professor also, if, if I remember correctly, you, you have an actual dictionary with 300 yeah. words. 600, so yeah. That. Yeah, I have, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, we needed, obviously we needed the words. I didn't want them to just be random words. So, and, and the words were supposed to be based on names, um, uh, partially. And so, so what we did, what I did is uh, I gave, I went to the Holocaust archives, specifically Auschwitz, and, uh, and pulled out real names of, of people from that part of the world. Uh, I mean, victims, obviously. And uh, from France, from Italy, Serbia, et cetera. And I took those, took those names, the list, long list of names. I mean, there was like thousands of names on that list. And I sent it to this professor linguist in uh, Moscow State University. And they gave him the, the task of, of uh, making a credibly grammatic language that had Eastern sounding uh, words, pronunciation, and, um, and for it to be based on those names. Uh, obviously, he started with just substituting words that were in italics in the script that were in that language, were supposed to be in that language. But then he just, as he was so happy to, to be able to create a language as a linguist to him that that was like, you know, an incredible um, opportunity. 
And so he um, he went a little farther, and and I have I have this very I, we made this language. It's very funny on the set. A lot of people spoke it actually. <laughs> funny enough. Can can you still speak it? Like. Oh. Ah, no, no. I mean, I, I remember all the words, but uh, I think you know we we, we would I spoke it as is a little bit uh, overstated. I think I think we would stick the words into, you know, into English or Russian for that matter when we were speaking. The, the script, the original script, was written in Russian, and I uh, I rewrote it in English. Um, didn't just translate it; I rewrote it quite a bit, and. Um, and so kind of making it mine. And um, you know, it was a, a very, very much a Tower of Babel, this production. I also don't know German. So for me, directing in, in you know a film that is 90% German was not easy. But I managed, you know, and you kind of caught on, you know, at the towards the end, towards the middle. Oh. Can you elaborate on, on this uh, uh, bubble tower and this cosmopolitan production? Yeah, film film was written in film written in in, in Russian, uh, based on a short story written in German, translated by me in English, passed on to all the crew. Uh, the crew had it in Russian in the original version. Uh, the actors had it in English. The crew was Russian uh, and Belarus, and the actors had it in English. And then the actual text had to be translated by someone into German so they could speak German. So it was, it was a crazy broken telephone all along. I was very afraid about losing the meanings and the subtlety of the, you know, of the dialogue and of the words, but it, I, apparently it didn't, which I'm very lucky. I want to ask two questions uh, before we, we, we move on to the... Uh, um public's question, uh, one will be very specific, one will be very broad. Uh, so the specific question, uh, I, uh, we were talking about Noel and you know, I, I had the privilege to speak with him too, um, not for this film, for his previous film, a BPM, which is a, a wonderful French film. He is outstanding in this film as well. And I know he's a very, he's a very intelligent guy, also a very special guy. Uh, he's he's a, one of, a one of a kind actor. Uh, so if you can talk about working with him and about his contribution to the to the part to the film he had a he had a very difficult task very very difficult task of 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 not um <clears throat> not playing the victim of not uh, it, it was a very fine line for him to walk i think for not trying to elicit pity for especially i didn't want that you know for for Showing, I think one of the things that we discussed constantly was how much fear do you show, you know? And it was one of those things where, you know, you can't show too much because Koch would catch on, but then, and you don't do the, you know, the sitcom thing where you turn away from Koch and go, you know, and, <laughs> and, and communicate fear. Um, so, it, you know, it was, we, we worked really, really hard. We were on the phone to each other every day before the shoot, and then very hard on his role. Lars was on autopilot. He he was incredible. He's just <laughs> I let him do whatever he wanted. Actually, um, I, I, I'll wait with my question because we we have a bunch of questions uh, from the public. Uh, there are two questions that I think are tied, so I can ask them together. Both of them anonymous attendees. First, is the film based on a memoir? And if so, what is the book title? And was the movie based on a true story? If so, was the ending uh, what actually happened? Uh, the film, the script was based at the author of the script, uh, who lives in Berlin, uh, is an old Russian Soviet immigrant. And he, um, he had read this story, a story, that had this kind of a plot, not completely, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And uh, <clears throat> sometime in his youth in the Soviet Union, we went into production. He had written the script inspired by that story, I guess. Uh, and the story is very rare. I mean, it's very hard to find. Um, it was written by Wolfgang Kohlhauser in 1952 in then Eastern Germany. And uh, it was called Invention of a Language. And it had a, a Jewish prisoner from Holland who um, 
teaches a kapo, who is also a Jew, but a kapo, um, in the camp, uh, Farsi. And that's it. It just had this time, it was a 10 page uh, short story. I mean, literally, uh, there was nothing we took from it except the, the initial concept of surviving by, by uh, faking a language. Uh, <clears throat> the names, the connection to the names was made up by us. The ending obviously made up by us and, and so on. So uh, the only things I took from it was the name Honored On, which is restaurant, because I liked the way it sounded. And uh, I also took um, the scene with the doctor, when the doctor suspects him of, um, possibly sent by Koch, the doctor suspects him of, uh, of um, you know, he grills him, what language were you speaking when you were in a fever? Uh, one more question by Mark uh, Seliber. Uh, when Koch was looking at the list of prisoners, by far, you will figure out that Gio was using, using the names to come up with his Parsi words. Did you consider that possible shift in the plot? Well, that, yes, I did, actually, funny enough. But I, I thought that that would, and I, I filmed a scene, uh, which I think turned the whole film on its head as an option. I kind of had it in my back pocket. I have no idea why, because I thought it would be very cool. When, when he, when Koch went to get him from that column of people, uh, going to Auschwitz in, in the forest. And he brings him, there's a scene where he brings, they have that talk where he calls him a murderer. And then he brings him into, into his office and throws him down behind his desk and goes right and goes sits down behind his desk, which is kind of funny, kind of a change of, uh, change of roles. And, uh, and uh, he goes, keep writing, Gilles refuses because you know, he says, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And um, Koch says, you keep writing or I will have you killed. He goes, no, I don't care. And he turns around this book that's in front of him and he shows it to Koch and he goes, this is, I've been, you know, what did I come up with some clever um, phrase? I said, um, you've been eating what I've been cooking for the last three years. <laughs> and uh, and I guess Koch understands food. And uh, uh, Koch closes before he can even go on. He shuts the book and goes, I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to hear anything. And that's when the explosions happen and, you know, the, the advance of the Americans starts. But it's, um, that would have eliminated, I didn't know how to end it then, you know, because I thought it would play against the character of Koch to, to then, I mean, it should, it should be really, really subtle. We should just wonder, does he know or doesn't he know? Does he suspect, doesn't, doesn't he suspect? To have him blatantly know, you know, first of all, we would eliminate the scene in Tehran completely um, because he wouldn't, he wouldn't have gone there anymore. At least if he did, he wouldn't have spoke Farsi to the border guards. And uh, uh, secondly, I think that, that uh, it would have, it would have made it hard. It would have, it would have, then I would have had to make Koch a nice guy, you know, to let him go, which was one of the things um, to still let him go kind of thing. And uh, one of the things that, again, the very fine line that I walked the whole film was how to, how much to humanize uh, the Nazis in general, Koch in particular. Uh, I, I didn't really humanize many of them, but I did. Uh, probably much more than we've seen up to this point in any kind of films on this theme or literature for that matter. Uh, it's, uh, you know, but we can't forget that it was a, it was real people doing that, you know, and it, it wasn't uh, in many films about the Holocaust and, and uh, about the Nazis, they're portrayed as automatons, robots, killing machines, you know, evil, nasty, uh, irritable, you know, yelling, shooting, slapping, torturing, and all that. And it's not that that didn't happen, but what we have to remember is that it happened, um, it was done by people who woke up in the morning in a little house on the outskirts of Auschwitz and um, 
and woke up and kissed their kids goodbye as they went to work, because they quite often brought their families there from Berlin. And the wife by and and would say when when are you gonna when are you gonna be home for dinner and he would say you know we have a train coming in today so you know probably kind of late and then he would go off to you know to kill thousands of jews of people babies children just like his and so on so you know to me it's you know it's been covered quite well by hannah arendt in um in uh, banality of evil but I, I wanted to do it in, in a film form in a way that they had, they had jealousies, they had past, they had uh, inter-office politics, you know, as, as every human would. They had, uh, a, you know, a mother who they loved. They, you know, they, they were human beings, first and foremost, like us. And that, to, to me, is what made it much more horrific, you know, than, than portraying them as you know, a scorpion, he stings, you know, or a, a killing robot, he kills, you know, so well, what can you do, you know, oh, no, you know, Hitler has uh, bamboozled them into, into it all, no, no, they, they quite often made that choice themselves as humans, and that's what's, what's really horrific, I, I wanted to show that. I think that that's, that's really fascinating, thank you so much for your, for your answer, uh, we have a question that I think is quite related to your last comment, uh, Mary asks, Mary, first she says it's a great film, and then she asks, uh, can you talk about some of the guard characters and the shifts in friendships and the backbiting that occurred between the male and female guards in the film? Yeah, well, that's, I, I did just now, Mary. So, you know, in, in a way, I did that to show them as human, you know, and, and possibly I would have loved to do more. Because, you know, a lot of people say, why did you drop those lines? And why didn't we see his reaction to her being sent off to the front, to Elsa being sent off to the front, Max's reaction, and so on. I just didn't have time for it. And I thought it would have been kind of a, an almanac of camp life. And, and uh, what I really, I wanted to stick closer to the main story, but still show that it was a machine that ran. You know, when, when, when Eichmann was tried in Israel, you know, in, in, the, in the trial, he said, I just made the trains run. What do you guys want from me? You know, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and the crazy thing is how, how it, is, it blows my mind. What his job was like an NFL uh, schedule maker to make sure that from all parts of that, they, they never doubled up, that they could always, they, that the camps would have time. I know this sounds horrific to even talk about it, but that the camps would have time to process these multitudes of people so that the train would the next train wouldn't roll in while they're still in the gas chambers. They need to clear them out. They need to burn the bodies. They need to, to do all these <laughs> horrible things. And Eichmann did that. He just sat there and said, okay, so they need X amount of time. Treblinka needs this. Bergen-Belsen needs that. Auschwitz needs that. <laughs> to me, that is, it's, it's like Koch cooking for them. It's, it's really not, not any different, you know? So, it, 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 uh, I wanted to show that. And I wanted to show these people who worked there. You know, a kid, a kid from Bavaria or wherever he was, Max, you know, wherever he was from, was in love with this, with this woman, you know, and, and truly and, and nice to her. And, and gives her the candy that he took out of the old woman's that he just shot purse. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you guys caught that when he goes on, when he goes on a date with her. You know, he goes here. These are for you. He took it out of the purse at the, you know, from from the first scene of the shooting. Um, you know, so yeah, people doing horrific things. It's a absolutely Stanford experiment. <laughs> uh, I, I want to add. We we have a one more, a fifteen more ten ten to fifteen more minutes. So if you want to ask a question now will be a, a good time. Um, I want to ask a question. You just mentioned the cooking. And, you know, usually in, in films, cooking, we, we, we see cooking in French comedies, uh, not in, not in uh, World War II films. We talk about working with the actors, working with the language. So how was working with 
you know, with the kitchen with the cooking scene. <laughs> Well, I don't know. We just, we just made it up. It was uh, no, but you know, I did I did find out how to make ice spine. You know, I did find out how to you know how how to run. How would they run the kitchen? You know, in a way, they usually had prisoners working there, uh, being guarded uh, the whole time, and uh, because it was very very you know they could have poisoned, they could have you know God knows what, right? So they watched them like a hawk the whole time, and. Uh, and uh, and it was usually the most privileged prisoners, the ones that ultimately survived because they could eat, and um, and um, and it was you know they were in warmth all day. They weren't breaking rocks, kind of thing. Working in some in some factories, um, it's you know it's. Um, I just wanted to say something a little bit more, I think, important than that. I think that if I'm very happy. I'm very pleased that we found that final scene. You know, found it, I mean, invented it, made it up, you know, because uh, that was also part of an earlier question. Was it made up, the final scene or not? Yes, of course it was. And, and uh, because if, if Gilles would have just survived and just gone on, if Koch let him out or he escaped, doesn't matter what he did, and just gone on, down those railroad tracks at the end, it would have been still pretty profound. I mean, maybe not 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 even profound, but it would have been like, oh, what a clever guy, you know, what a wonderful clever guy, Yiddishikov. You know, he 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 uh, he he knows. You know, we are we are we are pretty clever, us Jews. So therefore, you know, he survived. Uh, but he inadvertently, by only trying to survive himself for most of the movie. Inadvertently, he built a monument to 2,840 people who normally who would have been burned twice, you know, once in the oven of the fireplace of the commandant and the other time in the ovens of Auschwitz. And so, and that's why he sits there and cries is because he realizes the monumentality of what he's done, you know, inadvertently by trying to save his own skin. You know, and it's, it's to me, that's a great, fable in that way and it is a fable for those people who are wondering if it's a real story not a real story i've never um i've never uh i did some google searches and so on uh, there's never any documentation of, of something like that happening um but listen during the holocaust there were that's why i said inspired by a true story uh, and the true story wasn't uh, his survival but true story of the holocaust really and during the Holocaust, uh, many, many things like that happened. Very much a, you know, a uh, mind-boggling things. Very incredible things happened. Uh, stories of survival and stories of, of revenge and so on. And, and of uh, religious people being uh, somehow supported by, you know, by their faith. And, and it's all because to me, that's a fable too. You know, so 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 in a way, um, I'm very, I'm very pleased to have found that. Someone stole the question I was about to ask, so I'll I'll ask his question and then I'll ask one more and, and we can wrap. Uh, just thanks for this talk, which was I think extensive and, and passionate and so uh, insightful and fascinating and, and thought provoking. So an anonymous attendee first he says your film is a masterpiece. Perfectly filmed, acted, edited, talk to us about the role of the music it was never too obvious, but contributed to the film's beauty. That's another thing. Uh, music was written by Evgeny and Sasha Galperin. Uh, they live in Paris. They're Russian Jews. And uh, they, you know, what I didn't want and the task that I, that I had um, gave, the task that I gave them was not to do the schmaltz was not to do the, uh, I hate to call it, because in no way is it bad, but, you know, the Schindler's List, the pianist, the you know, life is beautiful, where, you know, you're tugging at the heartstrings and, and you're, you're making what there is on the screen. You're not trusting that the subject matter itself is going to tug at the heartstrings, basically, but trying to help it all along. And, uh, and I, wa I wanted a, a shockingly uh, modern 
if you know, I mean, if you know music, it is extremely didactic and modern. This this uh, this score, you know, compared to you know the the period piece that you're seeing on the screen, contrasted to that. And the only time I did play the the violin uh, was at the end, you know, during the credits was uh, the klezmer tune that that Evgeny and Sasha's father, this old Jewish man, had written and promptly died in. Uh, it had had recorded, played, and promptly died in uh, in Paris for this film. This was 2019 that that happened, uh, and um, you know Sasha detuned the violin so that it it had an even more haunting kind of a sound, and and uh, I, I think it's incredible. I've been very blessed to to have very very profound music in my in my films, very good music. Um, the late James Horner wrote music for House Sand and Fog and my second film. You know, I, I, and I, I do find that uh, as an extremely important tool, you know, that, that I have. I want to ask a, one, one last question. Um, we just talked, you were talking about how, it, how the film is based on a short story, a very based, a very, a very short, short story. So how, how different, uh, how different was the, the how different is the film from, from the first ideas you had when you first read this short story and thought about turning it into a novel? Like how, how, how much did, did the project evolve from the short story to, to the film? Oh, tremendously. I mean, it, as I said, the short story could be said in one sentence. I mean, it's a it's, it's very basic story. It's the idea, essentially. It's the guy survives the camp by teaching a man who can save him who can keep him from death and also at the same time holds his, holds his life in his hands uh, by teaching him a fake language because for some damn reason this guy needs this language. You know, that's, that's, that's essentially that's what the short story was. He didn't have um, he didn't have the same thing. He was a student, I think. I think Argio, and that's to the next question that's, that's uh, about the grammar and syntax that I see on the screen. You know, he didn't, he, he, I don't even think he was a, I mean, he says in the truck, he's rabbi's son. I'm pretty sure he wasn't, you know, in, the, in this version. I don't think he was a rabbi's son. I don't know. I think he might've been just one of those like tricksters, like a little coyote in the Southwest uh, lore or something like that, you know, just wandering around Europe at that time. Uh, and uh, because of the way he was dressed and the way he carried himself and, and just his, his uh, slippery, ways you know i i and and that's great i thought is that his his really his life was even up to then based on a lie and he just continues lying and he does something so damn special and so damn you know wonderful by <laughs> by remembering those names inadvertently you know which is another good you know good, good way to do it so the question is, um, Abner, I'll read it. Uh, why did you choose to not have grammar or syntax in the Persian language, in the fake Persian language? Um, because he wouldn't have known grammar or syntax in the fake Persian language. You know, he's not, he wasn't a linguist. And, but it did, it did, have, uh, it did have correct prefixes and suffixes, very much so. Like it did, you know, he, he did, he, he, and tenses. It was very important for me to have that so that the guy wouldn't catch on, you know, so that Koch wouldn't catch on. So that he at least knew. He at least knew to say go and went, you know, or they uh, or and him, you know, those things. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much for this talk. It was as almost as fascinating as the film. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Thank you again for, for, for the film. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, you know, I have I have a very very uh, uh, close connection to Boston. The mother of my children is from Boston. Um, whole family, uh, their her whole family is from there. Uh, the author of my of my first film uh, of the novel, Andre Debus the Third, is from Boston, and uh, he might have actually even been on watching this. Uh, because I told them that we were going to do this uh, this thing. So my, you know, 
thank you. Thank you, Boston. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vadim, and thank you, Avner. Uh, Vadim, we hope what whatever your next film is down the line, we hope that we can show it here in Boston, have a family reunion of sorts here. Um, but thank you both for a fantastic conversation, fascinating too. Um, and thank you all for your questions. Um, if uh, you would like, you can tell all your friends and family they have until the end of today to watch Persian Lessons. Um, and hopefully it comes to theaters where we can show it in person in this area. Um, yeah, uh, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your night, Vadim, in, in Moscow. And um, yeah, take care. And yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.